What's up, everybody? Happy Wednesday. Hope all you're having a great day so far. Getting into this episode of GH. Um, I got bit, bits and pieces of the episode because of weather reports, so I'm going to try to do my best here. Um, I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm disappointed because I was hoping Helena's mystery partner would have been somebody of importance, but no, apparently it was Peter. Boo. Um, I, I I suspected it, but I was hoping not. I was hoping that they would actually do a little twist in there. Maybe Jerry Jacks or somebody. But I'm like, why is this a big deal that Peter was involved in this? I thought everybody already knew Peter played a part in this. Jason and Drew and Maxie, they all, Robert, they all know that Peter played a part. So... Why is this newsworthy? I'm just trying to figure that out. Everybody knows that he played a role in this. I think what they don't know is that part of the story that Shiloh was talking about. That Peter was in Afghanistan and he helped Helena and Shiloh get the drop on Drew. And I guess, you know, maybe they don't know that. Or they're trying to whitewash Faison's part in this because Faison was a major part in all of this. But I guess he must have used Heinrich to get the job done, maybe, um, to facilitate all of this. But even still, like, what is the big deal? Everybody knows this. This ain't nothing new. That's why when he said Peter was there and I'm just rolling my eyes watching this whole thing like this isn't news. We already knew this. Well, I mean, most people already knew. That he played a part, you know what I mean? So, where's the shock? And of course, Shiloh wants to try and blackmail Peter to get him out of uh, Pettenville. First of all, how the hell is Peter supposed to get you out of this? How? Peter has no power. He, has, he doesn't know anybody influential enough to help you get out of all these charges. Or even get bail. So, how is he supposed to help you? And it's not like Peter's well off, because he's not. It was Valentin who bought the magazine for him or gave him the startup. So how was he supposed to get you out of this mess? It's going to take an act of Congress to get you out. How is little old Peter supposed to do it? Like you're asking for way too much, son. Way too much. How is somebody with no power, no authority, no money, no millions? How are they supposed to get you out of this? He doesn't know anybody influential enough. Or, I mean, how? How? I mean, he could possibly go to Valentin, but I don't even think Valentin got enough clout to get you out. And you already know, if Maxi and, God forbid, Robert find out about this, all it's going to do is prove Robert's point. That Peter is a lot like Faison. Even though he's being blackmailed, it's just, you know, even though the blackmail is stupid, because this is information that's not new, but... You're just going to be proving people's point about you. You know, you're helping this little freak get out of prison. It's not going to be favorable on you. And you're letting him blackmail you with the dumbest thing ever. That the worst kept secret. Everybody knows you played a part in it. Jason already know. He just chose not to go after Peter. Because all the years that he spent, you know, being isolated and drugged and away from the family, he chose to leave Peter alone. And for Anna's sake. He chose to leave Peter alone because I remember that conversation they had a couple years ago and Anna wanted to make sure that Jason wouldn't go after her son, her alleged son. So what is the big deal here? Like, I know good and well, you're not going to allow this boy to blackmail you over something so stupid that everybody already knows about. Because if you help him, God only knows how you're going to help him, because like I said, he has no power. He has no influence. So how are you going to help him? But, you know, if you help him, it's only going to ruin the current relationships that you've built so far in the community. Lulu, Maxi, you know what I'm saying? Like Finn, you know, people are just going to look at you sideways now if you help him. So it's not a good look to help him, especially over a dumb thing that everybody already knows. So why waste your time? You know, I wouldn't be blackmailed by him, especially somebody who ain't got no proof of nothing. All they got is word of mouth. That's all they got. Oh, I seen it. Oh, I seen it. And who the hell gonna believe Shiloh of all people? Even if they do believe him, so what? Who cares? Let the chips fall where they may. Who gives a crap? 
You know, you did all this work trying to redeem yourself in other people's eyes and prove that you're not phase on. So prove it. Walk away and tell him to go shove it and tell his story to whoever he wants. That's how you do that. See, that's how you handle blackmailers. You take away their power by simply telling people stuff that the blackmailer is blackmailing you with. So that way it takes away his power and he has no more cards left to play. This is the only card Shiloh has to play is to blackmail Peter to get him out. That's the only card he know he got to play. And if it don't work, he's stuck in Pettenville. Because after this, he ain't got nothing else to, you know, no cards. You have nothing else to, to use. You have no leverage. Peter needs to take away the leverage. Period. That's what smart people would do. So anyway, Sonny. As usual, he has to antagonize Ava. And I get it, you know. She switched out your son's pills. You still hate her, blah, blah, blah. I get it. Okay. You have your rights. But to walk up to her and basically say, well, I hope you don't show up because I guess Avery's first day of school or orientation or whatever is tomorrow. So he's like, oh, I hope you don't show up hungover. You know, a judge wouldn't look favorable on that. So now you're threatening her with court now. Sonny, go sit down somewhere. <laughs> Like, go sit down. But I, I do have to say, like, Ava do need to put the martinis down. Like, I'm just saying, you're drinking a little bit too much, a little too heavenly. You might want to go sit down with the alcohol. And, you know, Scott ain't making it no better by talking about he, gonna order, he wants her to drink more. He's sitting here ordering more martinis. I said, Scott, no. Cut it off. Cut the bar off. No more martinis for her. I swear, I think um, Mara West, I love Mara West. I think she loves her martinis in real life. I think she does. I remember, because you know how Ava Jerome loves her martinis? If you've ever watched As the World Turns when she played Carly, uh, Carly Snyder on that show, she loved her martinis too, because I remember Carly owned a bar, Core Metro. And I remember her drink of choice was always martinis with olives in it. Hence the drink with Ava Jerome. And I think she used to have the same drink when she played Diane Jenkins on The Young and the Restless. She really do love them damn martinis. I was like, I think she do in real life. <laughs> it might be her favorite drink in real life because every character she play, she got a martini with olives. Like, I'm like, and I just started noticing that too the other day. I just started noticing that. I said, she really do be drinking them damn martinis too, throwing them back. Like, she be drinking them martinis like that's water. Like, that's Avion water. Like, you need to chill with the martini, sis. Um, so anyway, that whole scene with the psychic was hilarious. When Scott walked up and she said she was a paranormal influencer, this fool whipped out his hands and said, read them. <laughs> Scott is stupid. Like, the foolishness with him. Scott is dumb, y'all. I cannot take him serious. Like, he, he is stupid. He just whipped out his hands and said, read him. <laughs> Yo, who be writing the script for Scott? I wonder if some of this is ad lib. Because that was hilarious when he did that. I said, Scott, sit down. Sit down. Scott is so full. <sighs> Scott is that type of person. You can't take him nowhere in public. He always got to act the fool. Um... So, yeah, Ava told me she had a dream and Kiki was wearing the same, you know, Kiki was visiting her as a ghost and sitting at the foot of her bed. And she was wearing the same outfit that she died in and she was just staring at her. But she couldn't tell if it was a good stare or a bad stare. Um, Ava needs to just let this go. Like, I think it's that guilt in her, like for the way that she treated Kiki and her getting into bed with the person that killed her, even though she didn't know it. But I think it's that guilt. I think that guilt is just manifesting. You know what I mean? Like, it's just on her mind, like, because she can't shake that guilt. And that's why I think she's conjuring her up in her dreams and she paying all this money to psychics. Ava, you just need to let go and let God. Honestly, just let it go. Like, this is just something you're going to have to live with. You need to maybe come to terms with it. You know, that's the best that you can do at this point. Um, but you know, she said that she wished that she could be like Franco basically and forget about her past. Like he basically can't forget about his now, now that he got Drew's memories. 
I'm like, you know, I get where Ava's coming from because sometimes you do want to just be so lucky to kind of forget the horrible things that you've done in life. But that's still no way to live, though. You know what I mean? Like, why would you want to live as somebody else? You know, you've done these horrible things. You need to own it, live with it, and just move forward. You know what I mean? Don't hide from it. Um. So anyway, Cameron, this boy. He's sitting there talking to Trina about selling a car. Even Trina was like, you must be crazy. Because he's sitting there blaming the car, talking about the car is cursed. That's why all these bad things been happening in the last few months. A car has nothing to do with the bad things that's been happening. Nothing to do with it. If you only knew. Bad things happen because of the chain reaction that people set off. This is all because of people, crazy people doing crazy things. That's why some bad things have been happening in the last few months. Now, Oscar getting a brain tumor and dying, that was just God's will. You know, that was, it was just, you know, his time, I guess. As short as it was, it was his time. But you can't blame all of that on no car. Ryan Chamberlain running around killing people, you can't blame that on a car. Shiloh and planting other people's memories in people, you can't blame that on a car. Like, Cameron is just racking up all this guilt. Like, that's why he just thinks that selling a car would make everything better. I'm like, no. Only thing is, is that you're going to go from a car back to your bicycle or walking. That's the only thing. I'm like, you know, car ain't got nothing to do with nothing. You know? And Trina was trying to tell him that. Like, Oscar gave you the car. Keep the car. Ain't got nothing to do with it. Now, this plot device was a little ridiculous. So, you mean to tell me... That the car that Kim and Drew bought for Oscar coincidentally belonged to Tex, his wife. And that's where he stashed the money. Because Cameron was like, he, um, because Elizabeth didn't think that the car was still, you know, she didn't think the money was still in the car. She was like, after all these years. And Drew was like, he keep, you know, he's not having flash flashbacks of his memories. But he keeps having these like little flickers of memory, like things are just instinctly coming to him from the past. Like he keeps having these little flickers of memory, like it's just like things are just coming to him in a flash, like, you know, instinctly. Like the car that Cam's driving, he was like, oh, that's Texas wife car. It's like it just keeps coming to him on an instinct level, even though it's contrived and, you know, plot point. But OK. I didn't believe it when I first started hearing about it. I said, oh, okay, that's that's a plot device. I think I might be able to overlook it, maybe, but I think it's a stupid plot device. But, I, you know, if it wraps up things, then that's fine with me. So the money was $1.5 million. I said, damn, no wonder Shiloh want that bag so bad. One point five. Listen, Cameron was shocked because he cleaned out that car. I'm like, you mean to tell me you cleaned out that car and you didn't notice a big box with tape wrapped around it all up in that trunk? You didn't notice that? How could you miss it? It's like a big rectangular box, like a square rectangular type box How could with a bunch of duct tape wrapped around it. How could you not see that when you cleaned out your car? How? how? Drew found it in five seconds. You cleaned out the entire car. So you mean to tell me you couldn't find that? Unless there's some secret compartment in the car that you didn't know about. <laughs> like, how did you not find it? And Drew found that real quick, right in that trunk. And he put it in that duffel bag in um, Draco, Frank, Frank and Drew, Franco. He wants to return the money to Afghanistan. But Drew was like, no, I'm going to go instead. You stay here. And he gave him some money because he was like, you're going to need some money um, to get by. But for now, he was like, you know what? I'm going to take this to Afghanistan and I'm going to handle it. Um, I felt bad for Liz though because when uh, Chelsea was talking to Liz and stuff, you know, Liz, Chelsea was basically telling Liz to continue to hold on tight, to basically telling her to hold on tighter to Franco, because Liz ain't trying to give up on her husband. I don't blame her, not at all. I I don't blame her. You know, it's hard for her. You know, to sit there and watch her husband walk around and fawn over a whole nother woman. <laughs> That he thinks that he's still in love with or whatever because he thinks that he lived somebody else's life. You know, that's tough. I feel bad for her, you know, especially when she don't really know what to tell the younger kids. Like, it's hard. 
But, you know, she got to keep fighting. Um, I felt bad for Kim, too, because Franco bringing up the past and him sending her letters. Because Franco keeps telling her about the past, bringing up Oscar, and it's making her relive all that hurt all over again. You know, so she felt like it was a little cruel on his part. But I'm glad that she's treating him as Franco. Like, do not treat him as Drew because you want him to know that he's not Drew. You know what I mean? You don't want to confuse the situation. So I'm glad that that's not what she's doing. But she's still thrown back. She's still, you know, taken aback by some of the things that he's bringing up. Like letters that he wrote her. And I guess she never got the letters or whatever. Because he was basically saying, had he known that she was pregnant... He would have never abandoned her or Oscar. He would have been there. You know, so it, it was just hard for her to hear that. You know what I mean? Because she always, in the back of her mind, wondered what if, you know, what they could have had, what her and Drew could have had back then. So I know it was tough for her to hear all that. You know, I know it was real difficult for her to hear that. Um, But anyway, I get where, you know, Lulu's coming from in terms of moving on and stuff. And I get where Maxie's coming from. I, you know, I want Lulu to date. I just, you know, kind of feel like it's too soon, you know, because her and Dante have been in each other's life now for 10 years. You know, they've been in each other's orbit for 10 years and it's hard now for him to just go away and him not to be around, you know, so it's like an adjustment period. So I don't think she should jump into a relationship that fast. You know, you should only jump into it when you're really ready. And if Lulu feels like she's really, really ready to jump into it, then I totally, I support it, but, you know, take some time for her, her career, and her kids, you know, the way she wants to do it, but, you know, Maxie, Maxie ain't letting it go, she got on that phone quick, fast, and in a hurry, and call for Dustin to give them a ride, I'm like, Maxie, let it go, Maxie don't know how to not butt in, you know what I'm saying, like, we, a lot of us probably have friends like that, you know, when we keep telling them, no, we're not going to do this. But, you know, they're persistent. They're like, no, we're not going to let you wallow in pity and self-pity. No, you're going to come out. You're going to hang out. You're going to move on. You know, you, a lot of people got friends like that. They just are like mosquitoes always buzzing in your damn ear <laughs> till, till you agree to do what they want you to do. And Maxie's that friend. But sometimes we do need that type of friend to kick it into high gear when you can't. You know what I mean? Like as much as we hate it, sometimes you got to like it. You know what I'm saying? Because your friends got your back and they got a lot of them have your best interests. And I do believe Maxie has her best interests. Honestly, I had a feeling Dev didn't take that money and Barry, the um, warehouse manager or whatever he is. Like he just kept blaming the money on Dev. Keep saying, oh, Dev took the money. But you have no proof of that, though. You didn't see him take it. And when Sonny came up with a simple solution, he told Jason, he said, you know what? Search him. Just search him. So they didn't find any money on Dev, but they did find $7,000 in his jacket. But the discrepancy is they found $7,000, but Jason said the deposit was for $10,000. So there's $3,000 missing. Barry had the $3,000 because he thought Sonny and Jason wouldn't notice, you know, $3,000 missing. But how are you going to accuse him of taking the whole deposit when the whole deposit wasn't found on him? Only half of it, more than half. That's suspicious right there. So Sonny put two and two together. He was like, you try to frame him because you didn't want, you know, you were angry that Sonny hired him or wanted you to work with him or him work for you. You were angry about it. You needed the money. So. You thought, why not plant some money on him and take some for myself? And Sonny wouldn't do anything about it because Dev is family and nobody would notice. You think Sonny and Jason can't count? The deposit was for $10,000. They only found 7000 So where's the other three? Of course, they're going to be suspicious. They're not stupid. And, you know, Sonny handled it differently than I thought he would. He simply told Barry, keep the $3,000 and gave him the $7,000. So he let him keep the whole $10,000 deposit, told him that's your severance pay. Use that money to get out of town, go to another coast. Um, straight like that. And he told Jason, simple and plain, make sure Barry got the message that he leaves town. because, And I, I think that's smart on Sonny's part because you never know. Like Just because you tell him to leave town don't mean that he won't stay and try to plot on you. 
You know what I'm saying? So I think it's smart that he sent Jason out there, you know, after Barry to make sure he got the hint. Leave town, stay out of town. You know what I mean? Smart. That's how you handle business. But, you know, Dev was kind of shocked that Sonny believed him. But, I mean, he believed him because Dev is not crazy or stupid enough to steal from Sonny. And he's not crazy enough to do it while Jason's there. Because the last time he tried to steal from Laura, only reason he did that was because, one, he didn't know who Laura was. Two, he didn't know Jason was around. You know what I mean? But he's not dumb enough to try to steal in Jason's presence. You know, and they, and you know, Sonny whipped him into shape and told him straight up, do your job, do it right, stop dropping bags, and do the work correctly. I like how they're being tough on him, you know what I mean? Because he needs a swift kick in the behind. But they're being fair also with him. Because like I said, working in that type of environment and stuff like that, I've worked with people who are straight up lazy, try to take, you know, two bags at a time and end up busting a whole bag because they're too lazy to go back and forth. You know what I'm saying? Like, trust, d do it right. Um, Only time I've ever grabbed two or three bags, it wasn't out of laziness. That was simply because we had customers and they wanted like 100 bags or something. And we had to load them up in their car, so I would take like two, three handfuls of it. You know what I mean? But they were big bags. But I ain't never bust the bag, though. I ain't never dropped the bag. That's the difference. But um, this was a pretty solid episode. Um, Hit the comment section. I think that's everything in this episode. Hit the comment section. Let me know what y'all thought about this episode. I will see you all later. Have a great day. Peace.